Hi everyone. Today is Tuesday, March 24th, uh, and today for AP Chemistry we're going to talk about something called Le Chatelier's Principle. Um, now over the past couple of days you've looked at a bunch of example problems, uh, figuring out sort of the relationships between the equilibrium constant K and the uh, concentrations of your products and your reactants at equilibrium. And so looking at a system at equilibrium and the math that you can do for this. Um, Le Chatelier's principle talks about what happens when you do something to disturb an equilibrium, if you do something to change the system at equilibrium. And so what happens is that if you, if you have that system and it's at equilibrium and you do something like change the temperature or the pressure or you change the concentration of a reactant or a product, the system is going to shift its equilibrium position to counteract the effect of the disturbance. Right? So whatever you do to the reaction, uh, the system's going to kind of shift to try to counterbalance or counteract that effect. Right, so the question here is, what does the system have to do to get back where it was? What does it have to do to get back to equilibrium? Right, and this feels like a sort of timely uh, analogy here. If we think about just sort of like what's going on with us not being in school and everything. Right, I don't know about y'all, but I've been feeling sort of like this over the past week. Right, so my system's not at equilibrium. And, you know, think about what things you have to do to get back here, to get back to that calm sense where, you know, you've got everything under control. The, the reaction is going to do the same thing. It's, it's going to shift. It's going to do something, but it's going to get back to that equilibrium eventually. The first thing that I want to talk about is the concentration. What happens when you change the concentration of either the reactants or the products um, when the system is already at equilibrium? All right, so if you increase the amount of reactants, so if you add more reactants to your system, uh, the system is going to shift towards products, right? So in this reaction here, we've got hydrogen and oxygen forming water. If I add hydrogen gas or if I add oxygen gas, I'm going to shift my equilibrium towards the product. I'm going to form more water. If, on the other hand, I decrease the amount of reactants, the system is going to shift back towards the reactants to make up for what I lost. Right, so if I've got hydrogen gas and I remove it from my, uh, from my reaction mixture, then the water all of a sudden is going to start turning back into hydrogen and oxygen to replace what's been taken away. Now, the same thing is going to generally apply to products. If you add product, um, the system is going to shift back towards the reactants to get rid of that extra product. Uh, if you take away your product, so if you're removing the product as it forms, uh, the reaction is going to shift to make up for that loss and, and make more product. Now, uh, we have to be careful here and, and note that since solids and liquids are not included in the equilibrium expression, uh, there will be no change in equilibrium when they are added or removed. So if we look at, again, this reaction up here at the top, um, adding or taking away this hydrogen or oxygen are going to affect the equilibrium because they're both gases. All right, so like I said, if you add either of those gases, the reaction is going to shift towards product. If you take away those gases, the reaction is going to shift back towards the reactants. Um, however, if we look at the water at the product here, we notice that it's a liquid. So you could add more and more, more and more water to the system and nothing would happen. It wouldn't shift back towards the reactants. You could take away water and it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't get more uh, formation of the product. So it's, this only works um, like all things in equilibrium if we're talking about a gas or an aqueous solution. All right, so changing the pressure and volume uh, of a system at equilibrium can also uh, disturb that equilibrium and cause it to shift to counteract that effect. Uh, we have to remember Boyle's law, our gas law relating pressure and volume. Remember that these two things have an inverse relationship. So if we talk about changing one, we're really talking about changing both, right? So if we increase the pressure, uh, the volume will go down. If we decrease the pressure, the volume will go up. Um, so remember that those are those have opposite effects. Um, so when the pressure is increased, so that means that you've decreased the volume, so you've squished those gas particles closer together to increase the pressure. Uh, the equilibrium is going to try to relieve that increased pressure by shifting towards with, towards whichever side has fewer moles of gas. All right. So looking at our equation here, we can see that on the left we've got two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of oxygen gas for three moles of gas total. Uh, and on the right, again, we have water that's a liquid, no gas at all. So this obviously has the fewer moles of gas. So if we were to take this reaction and decrease the volume, squish those molecules together, 
the equilibrium would shift towards the product to form more water uh, to, to get rid of that extra pressure, to relieve that extra pressure. Right? And so uh, just like with concentration, if you do the opposite thing, you're going to have pretty much the opposite effect. Uh, so if you increase the volume instead, if you give those particles more room to move around, that's going to decrease the pressure and equilibrium is going to shift towards the side with more moles of gas. So if we took our reaction and we expanded the container, if we made that container bigger, our equilibrium would shift back towards reactants to produce more hydrogen and oxygen. Um, now, a note on that, if both sides have equal amounts of moles, uh, changes in pressure or volume are not going to shift the equilibrium at all. So for example, if there were three moles of gas on both sides of the equation, you could increase and decrease the volume and nothing would happen to your equilibrium. Uh, you can also add what's called an inert gas to your system. So when I say inert, I just mean unreactive. So something that's not going to interfere with any of the reactions already going on in your system. Um, and if that, if that inert gas is added at a constant external pressure, that's going to cause the volume of your container to expand. So remember Avogadro's law, right? If we have some gases in a container uh, and that container is able to increase in size, then adding uh, more moles of gas is going to cause uh, more collisions, which is going to increase the volume. All right, so if we have a container where the volume is able to get bigger, it will. So that volume will go up. And that's actually going to have the same effect as uh, we just talked about in the last slide. So the same effect as reducing the pressure uh, by putting the, the mixture in a larger container. Right, so if that inner gas isn't reacting with anything and all it's doing is causing your container to get bigger, then your overall effect is for the volume to go up um, and the equilibrium to shift towards the side with more moles of gas. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got an inert gas and you add that to a constant volume mixture, so a rigid container where the size can't change, um, then it's going to have no effect on the equilibrium at all. The next thing that can affect the equilibrium and uh, that we can think about with Le Chatelier's principle is the temperature, right? So if we take a reaction at equilibrium, we could heat it up, we could cool it down, and what's going to happen is going to depend on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So remember we talked about what this means in the last unit, right? So when we talk about energy, remember we have to think about the system and the surroundings. Right, the system is your reaction. The surroundings are literally everything else in the universe. So an endothermic system is absorbing energy from the surroundings. That means that the surroundings get colder. So you're going to feel in an endothermic reaction, uh, when you feel your reaction mixture, it's going to feel cold because it's taking heat from the surroundings. And remember that your enthalpy delta H is going to be a positive number greater than zero. For an exothermic reaction, it's doing the opposite. The system is releasing energy into the surroundings, which means that your system is losing energy, but the surroundings are gaining that energy. So you're going to feel your reaction container get warmer. Um, and remember that the enthalpy for an exothermic reaction is negative. It's going to be less than zero. So that delta H is less than zero for an exothermic reaction. Remember, we can also think about this in terms of these uh, energy profiles where we've got the reactants on the left side, the products on the right side, um, and we're plotting potential energy versus the progress of the reaction, right? So remember that for an endothermic reaction, um, our products are gonna be at a higher energy. So the system has absorbed energy, the delta H is positive, and, um, and we're ending higher than we started. It's the opposite for an exothermic reaction. Um, the system is losing energy when it goes from reactants to products, so that energy is released, delta H is negative, and our products are lower than our reactants. In an endothermic reaction, so when delta H is greater than zero, you want to consider heat as if it's a reactant. Now remember that heat does not have mass, it doesn't take up space, it's not actually a reactant, but you're going to treat it the same way that you treat a reactant when you think about concentration. All right, and so in an endothermic reaction, if you add heat, it's like you're adding a product or like you're adding a reactant and the equilibrium is going to shift to make more product. If you take away heat, if you take an endothermic reaction and you cool it down, uh, then it's like it's taking away a reactant and your reaction is going to shift to form more reactants. 
If you've got an exothermic reaction, so delta H is less than zero, delta H is negative, you're gonna consider heat like a product. And again, it's not actually a product, it doesn't have any atoms, it's not made of anything, but you're just gonna treat it the same way that you treat a product, right? So if you add heat to an exothermic reaction, if you heat it up more, that's like adding, um, adding more product, which will cause your equilibrium to shift towards reactants. If you take away heat, if you cool down an exothermic reaction, it's like taking away a product, which will shift your, uh, your equilibrium to make more product to replace what's lost. All right, so we can look at the same uh, reaction we've been thinking about, uh, hydrogen plus oxygen forming water here. If we look at the delta H value for this reaction, we can see that it's negative 286 kilojoules per mole. That means that it's an exothermic reaction. All right, so what we can do is kind of write out our, uh, write out our equation here and add heat over here as if it's a product, right? So we know that this, this reaction is producing heat, okay? And so if we were to take this hydrogen and oxygen and water mixture and we were to heat it up, if we put it on a hot plate and heated it up, that's like saying we're adding uh, a product here. And so that's gonna make our equilibrium shift to the left and we're gonna get more hydrogen and oxygen gas. On the other hand, if we take away heat, if we put this reaction mixture in an ice bath, right, to take the heat away, um, then it's like taking away a product. And so our equilibrium is gonna shift to make more water. The last thing that I wanna talk about is catalysts and, in and inhibitors, right? And so we talked about this a little bit uh, in our virtual class the other day, but when you add a catalyst, which speeds up your reaction or an inhibitor, which slows it down, uh, those are not going to shift the equilibrium to the left or the right, and it is not going to affect the equilibrium constant. All right, so remember, if you change the temperature of your reaction, you can change the equilibrium constant, um, but a catalyst is not going to do anything except for except for allow your system to get to equilibrium faster, right? So everything will happen faster, that's a kinetics thing, but that is unrelated to uh, where the equilibrium lies, right? And same thing for an inhibitor, it's gonna slow it down, but it's not gonna change, uh, change your system or cause it to move to the left or to the right. Um, so that's the last thing that we're gonna talk about with Le Chatelier's principle. Um, I've posted some practice problems on AP Classroom and then tomorrow in class, you will work on a virtual Le Chatelier's principle lab. So you can kind of see in action what happens to the reactions when you change these different conditions.